Hello everybody. So uh, in this video we're going to uh, talk about uh, sheaves and uh, pre-sheaves. So before we uh, we state the definitions, let's um, briefly see what's the idea behind um, uh, this definition. So okay, so we recall some basic things from from classical algebraic geometry. So in particular, we consider uh, an affine variety X and so in classical algebraic geometry, we start with this uh, geometric object X that we want to study, and then uh, we associate to it the so-called um, affine coordinate ring, which is, uh, by definition, it's going to be the polynomial ring modulo uh, the ideal of X, right? Uh, so this is this is a ring, and uh, it turns out that this is a, a finitely uh, generated K algebra, and uh, this is the algebraic object that we attach to a geometric object that we want to understand, right? Now, uh, when I say affine variety, um, what I really mean, I mean, one way is to define it more classically, which means that you you embed, I mean, every affine variety is going to be, uh, by definition, a subset of, uh, uh, of some uh, affine end space, but uh, I'm actually uh, currently reading um, algebraic geometry from uh, Goertz and Wethorn, and uh, what they do is define this notion of a space with functions, uh, which means that um, we, we don't just consider X alone, but we also have this um, uh, this family of, of, um, of maps uh, on every open uh, subset of our affine variety. And, uh, well, I'm not going to state the definition of a space with functions, but it turns out that this is a sheaf. This is a sheaf uh, of k algebras of k algebras on X, right? Um, so to be even more precise, uh, what uh, Goetz and Wethorn do is that they, first of all, they define that this this so-called no, uh, this this notion of a space with functions associated to to an, to an irreducible affine algebraic set, and uh, then they define an affine variety to be something that is isomorphic as a space with functions to some um, space with functions associated to some uh, irreducible affine algebraic set, right? So the reason they do that is because they want to motivate the, no the notion of a sheaf, right? So in, in modern algebraic geometry, we have this, uh, uh, we, we in a sense, we are, we are somehow working backwards. So we have, so in a classical setting, we have, we have this thing, but now we, we start with, an arbitrary commutative ring with with a unity, um, and then we we want to get something uh, geometric here, right? And it turns out that the correct um, the correct uh, geometric object is uh, the spectrum of the ring A, which is um, uh, all the the prime ideals in A. So the reason why this is um, a geometric object is something that I'm not going to, to discuss right now. I mean, one, one first step is to to uh, endow this set with a topology, the so-called Zariski topology. Um, but anyway, so, okay, as we said, we're somehow working backwards, which means that uh, looking at this uh, analogy, uh, the ring A should correspond to the coordinate ring of X, right? To the coordinate ring of some geometric object, namely uh, the spectrum of A. Uh, but now, um, we know from, from classical algebraic, um, algebraic geometry that uh, we have an isomorphism of K algebras between uh, the co coordinate ring and this, uh, this set over here, right? On functions, polynomial functions on X. Uh, therefore, the coordinate ring is, uh, we can identify it with, with elements of the coordinate ring with functions on our geometric object, which means that um, elements of, of A should uh, somehow be considered um, as uh, functions um, on uh, the spectrum of A, right? On the geometric object. Um, but strictly speaking, we, we can't really do this, right? But what we can do is the following. Uh, so if F is an element in A and P is a prime ideal of A, um, so we have we have the following question: How to define how to define f of p, right? So we actually what we actually do is we 
take the ring A, <clears throat> we localize it P, right? Uh, and then we, uh, well, first of all, actually, before we localize, we, we consider A, and then we take the natural map here, and then we know that this is, since P is a prime ideal, this is going to be a local ring. Uh, so it has a unique maximal ideal, which is P times AP. So uh, we map this to, to, to this guy over here, right? Which is uh, which is a field, and it's uh, sometimes noted by uh, by K, K of P. Uh, right? So we take an element F, and we map it through this uh, composition over here, which is going to be uh, F over 1 modulo this guy over here. Okay. Uh, right, so we don't really have a function. That's the first, the first, um, the first problem, right? Because every, because the image of, of, of P under F, you know, lives in, in this K of P, but, you know, this, of course, varies with as p varies, right? So we don't really have a function. Uh, but this is a good first step because, for example, uh, if f is an element in A, uh, we have this, um, we, we have this, uh, the, the so-called principal open subsheet, which, uh, by definition, these are all the prime ideals in A uh, that don't contain, um, don't contain uh, f, right? These are the so-called principal open subsets and they form um, a basis for the, for the Zariski topology but it doesn't really matter but anyway now um, for example if we we, we can it, it turns out that we can somehow see this uh, this this principal open subsets as uh, uh, the functions um, that uh, don't uh, such that the functions f, right, elements in A such that um, f of p is not equal to 0, right, because saying that f of p uh, is not equal to 0, by definition this is equivalent to the fact that f over 1 modulo this guy is not going to be equal to this guy over here, but now it's easy to see uh, using certain facts from uh, commutative algebra that uh, this is exactly equivalent to the fact that f is not an element in p, right? So, so it's not a bad definition, right? Uh, yes, using using this definition over here, we can just d of f becomes uh, uh, all the all the points in our space in our geometric objects that uh, don't uh, kill f, right? Such that f of p is not equal to zero. Okay, so this is the so so. Why, so it turns out that the the right notion to to fix this this problem over here not having one target, not having functions, um, is the notion of a sheaf, right? Because we can do what we did uh, uh, previously using this notion of uh, space with functions. Uh, so we have to use uh, we have to use sheaves, right? It turns out that it's a good step to work with. Uh, um, okay, so let's um, let's move to the um, the definition of a sheaf and of a free sheaf. Uh, okay, so in order to define a sheaf, we have to define a pre sheaf. Okay, so let me fix um, the topological space. Okay. Uh, a pre sheaf F on X is uh, f so for every open. A subset of our topological space, we have um, we have a set denoted by uh, f of u, and um, for every uh, inclusion of open subsets. We have um, a function denoted um, restriction from v to u, going from f of v to f of u. Okay. Um, so we have these things such that uh, 
Okay, so that um, first of all, uh, for every uh, open subset, uh, we want the restriction from u to u to be the identity on f of u, and um, we also want to have um, so for every um, for every inclusion uh, u subset of v subset of w um, we want to have uh, okay let's see so we want the uh, if we take the restriction from w to u we want this to be the same as um, as this this thing over here Right, so if you first restrict from w from w to v and then from v to u, we want to be the same from restricting uh, restricting directly from w to v, right? So um, before, so this is the definition of a, of a pre shift, right? We have this uh, this data over here, right? For every open, we have a set noted f of u, and for every inclusion, we have uh, a restriction, and uh, we want to those things to satisfy uh, uh, these things over here, right? So the, the idea is that um, that uh, elements of uh, well, first of all, let me just make the following remarks. So first of all, um, uh, elements S uh, living in this set over here are called are called sections uh, over U um, sections of the precif f over u and uh, the idea is that this guy should be thought of as functions on uh, the subset u the open subset u and see how they don't have to be that we don't specify their target right which uh, it's going to play a role because as we as we said before in the in the in the sense of uh, in the case of a spectrum uh, we had the problem that uh, elements of the ring could not be seen uh, precisely as functions, right? Uh, okay. Uh, and also before, okay. So the other remark is that uh, if uh, if S is an element living in F of V, then um, then sometimes the restriction from uh, from V to U of S is going is going to be denoted by S restricted to U. Okay. Um, okay. So before I move on to the definition of a sheaf, I should also mention that um, um, a pre-sheaf um, f on x, well, a pre-sheaf, yeah, I should also mention that we are basically defining a pre-sheaf of sets, right? Um, you can actually define a pre-sheaf of uh, billion groups, of rings, of modules, of algebras, uh, whatever you, I mean, with values in some category anyway. Uh, so a pre uh, of sets on X is um, actually it can it can be seen um, uh, is a functor, a contravariant functor. Um, uh, from from the category of open subset of X to the category of sets. Right, it's nothing more than that. It's, it, these are exactly the same thing. This is uh, an easy exercise, right? Okay, so let's now move on to the definition of um, uh, of a sheaf, right? Um, okay, um, the pre sheaf f on X is called a sheaf if um, if the following hold uh, for every uh, open subset of X and every open uh, covering of U. Uh, 
right? So, um, so there are two things that have to be true. Uh, okay, let's see. So uh, if we have um, S and T uh, B sections of F over U uh, such that if I restrict uh, restrict S to U I and this is the same as T restricted to U I and these these are equal for every I. Uh, Right, so if we have two elements living in f of u such that this condition holds, then we have to we, we have to have that um, um, that uh, s and t were the same to begin with. Right, so the way we think we think this is that uh, functions are um, characterized locally. Right, if they agree locally, then they're going to be the same function to, to the same function to begin with. Well, of course. You know, elements of I mean, sections of f over u don't have to be functions, right? But we do think them as such. And uh, the second thing is that um, okay, it's the following. So, say we have um, some family uh, of elements living in in every ui, and let's say that they agree on every uh, intersection. So. We have this um, we have uh, this uh, relation over here then uh, what we want to, to have is that um, then we must have uh, a necessarily unique element s uh, living in f of u uh, such that if I restrict it to u i then this is going to be s i for each i okay so that these definitions seem um, somehow abstract, but it turns out there are many, many examples of many classical examples coming from uh, differentiable manifolds or even just, you know, talking about continuous functions that uh, these things hold, right? So uh, sheaves and pre-sheaves uh, arise in many places and probably, I'm probably going to make another video with uh, examples of uh, sheaves and pre-sheaves. So um, that's all I wanted to say for, for this video and uh, thank you for, for watching.